Section 5 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1. By Ida L. Pfeiffer. I chose a Friday for an excursion to Scutari, the celebrated burying place of the Turks in order that I might have an opportunity of seeing the howling dervishes. In company with a French physician, I traversed the Bosphorus in a kike. We passed by the Leander's Tower, which stands in the sea, a few hundred paces from the Asiatic coast, and has been so frequently celebrated in song by the poets. We soon arrived at our destination. It was with a peculiar feeling of emotion that for the first time in my life I set foot on a new quarter of the globe. Now, and not till now, I seemed separated by an immeasurable distance from my home. Afterwards, when I landed on the coast of Africa, the circumstance did not produce the same impression on my mind. Now, at length, I was standing in the quarter of the earth which had been the cradle of the human race, where man had risen high, and had again sunk so low that the Almighty had almost annihilated him in his righteous anger. And here in Asia it was that the Son of God came on earth to bring the boon of redemption to fallen man. My long and warmly cherished wish to tread this most wonderful of the four quarters of the earth was at length fulfilled, and with God's help I might confidently hope to reach the sacred region whence the true light of the world had shone forth. Scutari is the place towards which the Mussulman looks with the hope of one day reposing beneath its shade. No disciple of any other creed is allowed to be buried here, and here, therefore, the Mohammedan feels himself at home, and worthy of his prophet. The cemetery is the grandest in the world. One may wander for hours through this grove of cypresses without reaching the end. On the gravestones of the men turbans are sculptured, on those of the women fruits and flowers, the execution is, in most cases, very indifferent. Though neither the chief nor the tributary streets in Scutari are even, they are neither so badly paved nor quite so narrow as those at Para. The great barracks, on a height in the foreground, present a splendid appearance, and also afford a delicious view towards the Sea of Marmora and the inimitably beautiful Bosphorus. The barracks are said to contain accommodation for ten thousand men. At two o'clock we entered the temple, a miserable wooden building. Every Mussulman may take part in this religious ceremony. It is not requisite that he should have attained the rank and dignity of a dervish. Even children of eight or nine stand up in a row outside the circle of men to gain an early proficiency in these holy exercises. The commencement of the ceremony is the same as with the dancing dervishes, they have spread out carpets and skins of beasts, and are bowing and kissing the ground. Now they stand up and form a circle together with the laymen, when the chief begins in a yelling voice to recite prayers from the Koran. By degrees those forming the circle join in and scream in concert. For the first hour some degree of order is still preserved. The performers rest frequently to husband their strength, which will be exerted to the utmost at the close of the ceremony but then the sight becomes as horrible as one can well imagine anything. They vie with one another in yelling and howling, and torture their faces, heads, and bodies into an infinite variety of fantastic attitudes. The roaring, which resembles that of wild beasts, and the dreadful spasmodic contortions of the actors' countenances, render this religious ceremony a horrible and revolting spectacle. The men stamp with their feet on the ground, jerk their heads backwards and forwards, and certainly throw themselves into worse contortions than those who are described as having been in old times vexed with a devil. During the exercise they snatch the covering from their heads, and gradually take off all their clothes, with the exception of shirt and trousers. The two high priests who stand within the circle receive the garments one after another, kiss them, and lay them on a heap together. The priests beat time with their hands, and after the garments have been laid aside, the dance becomes faster and faster. Heavy drops of perspiration stand on every brow. Some are even foaming at the mouth. 
The howling and roaring at length reach such a dreadful pitch that the spectator feels stunned and bewildered. Suddenly one of these maniacs fell lifeless to the ground. The priests and a few from the circle hurried towards him, stretched him out flat, crossed his hands and feet, and covered him with a cloth. The doctor and I were both considerably alarmed, for we thought the poor man had been seized with apoplexy. To our surprise and joy, however, we saw him about six or eight minutes afterwards suddenly throw off the cloth, jump up, and once more take his place in the circle to howl like a maniac. At three o'clock the ceremony concluded. I would not advise any person afflicted with weak nerves to witness it, for he certainly could not endure the sight. I could have fancied myself among raving lunatics and men possessed, rather than amidst reasonable beings. It was long before I could recover my composure and realize the idea that the infatuation of man could attain such a pitch. I was informed that before the ceremony they swallow opium to increase the wildness of their excitement. The Achmedan, place of arrows, deserves a visit, on account of the beautiful view obtained thence. The traveler should see it if he be not too much pressed for time. This is the place which the sultan sometimes honors by his presence when he wishes to practice archery. On an open space stands a kind of pulpit of masonry, from which the sultan shoots arrows into the air without mark or aim. Where the arrow falls, a pillar or pyramid is erected to commemorate the remarkable event. The whole space is thus covered with a number of these monuments, most of them broken and weather-stained, and all scattered in the greatest confusion. Not far from this place is an imperial kiosk with a garden. Both promise much when viewed from a distance, but realize nothing when seen from within. Whoever wishes to appreciate in its fullest extent the charm of the views round Constantinople should ascend the tower in Galata near Pera, or the Seresker in Constantinople. According to my notion, the former course is preferable. In this tower there is a room with twelve windows placed in a circle, from which we see pictures such as the most vivid imagination could hardly create. Two quarters of the globe, on the shores of two seas united by the Bosphorus, lie spread before us. The glorious hills with their towns and villages, the number of palaces, gardens, kiosks, and mosques, Chalcedon, the Princess Islands, the Golden Horn, the continual bustle on the sea, the immense fleet, besides the numerous ships of other nations, the crowds of people in Pera, Galata, and Topana, all unite to form a panorama of singular beauty. The richest fancy would fail in the attempt to portray such a scene, the most practiced pen would be unequal to the task of adequately describing it. But the gorgeous picture will ever be present to my memory, though I lack the power of presenting it to the minds of others. Frequently, and each time with renewed pleasure, I ascended this tower, and would sit there for hours in admiration of the works of the created and of the Creator. Exhausted and weary with gazing was I each time I returned to my home. I think I may affirm that no spot in the world can present such a view, or anything that can be compared with it. I found how right I had been in undertaking this journey in preference to any other. Here another world lies unfolded before my view. Everything here is new, nature, art, men, customs, manners, and mode of life. He who would see something totally different from the everyday routine of European life in European towns should come here. In the town of Constantinople we come upon a wooden bridge, large, long, and broad, stretching across the Golden Horn. The streets of the town are rather better paved than those of Para. In the bazaars and on the sea coast alone do we find an appearance of bustle. The remaining streets are quiet enough. The bazaar is of vast extent, comprehending many covered streets, which cross each other in every direction and receive light from above. Every article of merchandise has its peculiar alley. In one, all the goldsmiths have their shops, in another, the shoemakers. In this street you see nothing but silks, in another, real cashmere shawls, etc. Every dealer has a little open shop, 
before which he sits, and unceasingly invites the passers-by to purchase. Whoever wishes to buy or to look at things sits down also in the front of the booth. The merchants are very good-natured and obliging. They always willingly unfold and display their treasures, even when they notice that the person to whom they are showing them does not intend to become a purchaser. I had, however, imagined the display of goods to be much more varied and magnificent than I found it, but the reason of this apparent poverty is that the true treasures of art and nature, such as shawls, precious stones, pearls, valuable arms, gold brocades, etc., must not be sought in the bazaars. They are kept securely under lock and key in the dwellings or warehouses of the proprietors, whither the stranger must go if he wishes to see the richest merchandise. The greatest number of streets occupied by the followers of any one trade are those inhabited by the makers of shoes and slippers. A degree of magnificence is displayed in their shops, such as a stranger would scarcely expect to see. There are slippers which are worth one thousand piastres, a pair, and more. They are embroidered with gold and ornamented with pearls and precious stones. The bazaar is generally so much crowded that it is a work of no slight difficulty to get through it, yet the space in the middle is very broad, and one has rarely to step aside to allow a carriage or horseman to pass. But the bazaars and baths are the lounges and gossiping places of the Turkish women. Under the pretense of bathing, or of wishing to purchase something, they walk about here for half a day together, amusing themselves with small talk, love affairs, and with looking at the wares. Without spending a great deal of money, it is very difficult to obtain admittance to the mosques. You are compelled to take out a firman, which costs from one thousand to twelve hundred piastres. A guide of an enterprising spirit is frequently sufficiently acute to inquire in the different hotels if there are any guests who wish to visit the mosques. Each person who is desirous of doing so gives four or five colonnati to the guide, who thereupon procures the firman, and frequently clears forty or fifty guilders by the transaction. An opportunity of this description to visit the mosques generally offers itself several times in the course of a month. I had made up my mind that it would be impossible to quit Constantinople without first seeing the four wonder mosques, the Hagia Sophia, Sultan Ahmad, Osmanaji, and Suleimanaji. I had the good fortune to obtain admittance on paying a very trifling sum. I think I should regret it to this day if I had paid five colonnati for such a purpose. To an architect these mosques are no doubt highly interesting. To a profane person like myself they offer little attraction. Their principal beauty generally consists in the bold arches of the cupolas. The interior is always empty, with the exception of a few large chandeliers placed at intervals, and furnished with a large number of perfectly plain glass lamps. The marble floors are covered with straw mats. In the Sophia Mosque we find a few pillars which have been brought hither from Ephesus and Baalbek, and in a compartment on one side several sarcophagi are deposited. Before entering the mosque you must either take off your shoes or put on slippers over them. The outer courts, which are open to all, are very spacious, paved with slabs of marble and kept scrupulously clean. In the midst stands a fountain, at which the Mussulman washes his hands, his face, his feet, before entering the mosque. An open colonnade, resting on pillars, usually runs round the mosques, and splendid plantains and other trees throw a delicious shade around. The mosque of Sultan Ahmed, on the Hippodrome, is surrounded by six minarets. Most of the others have only two, and some few four. The kitchens for the poor, situated in the immediate neighborhood of the mosques, are a very praiseworthy institution. Here the poor Mussulman is regaled on simple dishes, such as rice, beans, cucumbers, etc., at the public expense. I marveled greatly to find no crowding at these places. Another, and an equally useful measure, is the erection of numerous fountains of clear good water. This is the more welcome when we remember that the Turkish religion forbids the use of all spirituous liquors. At many of these fountains servants are stationed, 
whose only duty is to keep ten or twelve goblets of shining brass constantly filled with this refreshing nectar, and to offer them to every passer-by, be he Turk or Frank. Beer-houses and wine-shops are not to be found here. Would to heaven this were the case everywhere else! How many a poor wretch would never have been poor, and how many a madman would never have lost his senses! End of section 5